Anyway, I'm talking about victory this morning. It amazes me how God works. Adam had no clue. Nobody had any clue what I was going to speak on this morning. And there that last song was about victory. And God just amazes me through the Holy Spirit how he works. Anyway, who would rather have victory in their life than defeat? Amen. Okay, for those who didn't raise your hand, I'm going to talk to you after the service. <laughs> I got a short story before uh, I read the scripture we're going to use. Uh, about a month or so ago, I, uh, I decided I needed a new belt. My belt was falling apart. Okay, so I had a gift, gift card uh, from Kohl's, and I went to Kohl's and looked around. And I'm like my wife. I'm a thrifty shopper. And I wasn't going to pay $40 for a belt. <laughs> So you can guess where we ended up, Walmart. <laughs> so anyway, I find my belt. I get home the next morning, I put on my trousers and I put the belt on and, and I'm struggling and I holler to the wife, I need to do it. And she said, do what? I said, I gotta go on the diet. She said, what do you mean? I said, I can't see to put, help my belt. I can't see the holes to put, fix my belt. And you know what she said? I don't want you getting skinny. <laughs> I said, skinny, I can't see to put on my belt. So anyway, uh, I talked to my buddy. He, he went on this diet, and he lost 15 pounds in 40 days. And I said, give it to me. I need to do something. So I go on this diet, and in about 10 to 14 days, I uh, hadn't weighed myself. And I had just so happened I had uh, a six-month checkup at my doctor's. So the little nurse, you know, she says, step up on the scale. I did. I looked down. I didn't have my glasses on, but I looked down, and I seen where it was. I gained a pound. <laughs> I said, that scale has to be wrong. Do you know? It's, it's calibrated. It's, it's right. So anyway, I experienced defeat there. But... A couple weeks later, I stuck to the diet, and I weighed myself at home, and my scale was right too, and I lost four pounds, so I gained a victory. Praise the Lord. <laughs> okay, so it's amazing to me how God uh, works through the Holy Spirit. I want to read uh, the scripture we want to use this morning for the basis for this message is found in the 23rd chapter of 2 Samuel. Seemingly a passage of scripture relative only to history. But by applying it to our everyday walk with the Lord, it can have tremendous spiritual significance. Reading the 11th and 12th verse. Next to him was Shammah, son of Agi, the Herorite. When the Philistines banded together at a place where there was a field of lentils, Israel's troops fled from them. But Shammah took the stand in the middle of the field. He defended it and struck the Philistines down. And the Lord brought about a great victory. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. And we just pray, God, that you would hide your word in our heart. Minister to us, Lord, that we may leave this place closer to you in our walk with you. Amen. In this chapter, uh, it actually mentions three of David's mighty warriors of this particular time, Shammah being one of them. And throughout the Old Testament, we read how God gave the Israelites many victories. But we also read when they disobeyed with their pagan worship, and their disobedience, rebellious behavior, he also brought judgment and defeat. But notice what it says in that verse. Shammah did the fighting, but God gave the victory. Amen. I would like to use this morning as a subject, the key to victory. God gives us a key, and that key, of course, is faith. But it 
also involves more than just faith, as we will see this morning. First, we must understand that God created mankind for his pleasure and his glory and to have fellowship with him. Not to live a life of defeat, but to live a life of victory. But since God created mankind with a free will, unfortunately, man made the wrong choice, thus opening the door for defeat to enter in. However, God in his mercy and grace provided a way, or a key, if you will, to the believer to have a victorious life, and that key is faith. But when a person receives salvation, God doesn't promise us a life of no problems or heartaches, and I'm sure all of us could testify to that. But by getting into his word, reading it, studying it, allowing it to penetrate our heart and mind with prayer, we find that God makes it possible for a believer to have victory in the midst of all of our problems. I have a uh, devotional book I use in the mornings when I first get up, separate from my reading the word and prayer that I do later in the day. And earlier this week, I read uh, the devotion that dealt with God's love and obedience. And I've used this devotional, this is the third year now, but I like it so much because every time I read it, something new jumps out at me. And this particular morning, there was two lines that jumped out at me. And I had to go to my wife after I read them after breakfast and share it with her. And here are the two lines. The indwelling life of God makes obedience possible. The indwelling love of God makes obedience delightful. Now what that first line says to me is the closer we get in our relationship with God, the easier it is to be obedient to him. And the second line, that indwelling love of God makes obedience delightful. Now that line says to me, the more we allow God's love to penetrate our heart, it no longer becomes a burden to be obedient, but a delight or a joy. And as we look at having victory today in this message, that teaching alone can help us tremendously. So back to the second chapter of Samuel. It actually mentions two other mighty warriors of David in verses 8 through 10. First is Adno, the Ezanite, and Eleazar, the Aoite, who God gave great victories to King David over the Philistines. But to save time this morning, since Adam told me I only had an hour, <laughs> we, will, we will concentrate on Shammah. So here we find Shammah and his fellow Israelites in this field of lentils, or bean patch as we call them today. A piece of ground that they worked and labored on until now the crop was ready to be harvested. But they look up, and much to their dismay, they say a troop, the Bible says, of Philistines gathered, and what did they do? They ran. They fled. Man, they ran for their lives. They were scared. I ask you this morning, I ask myself this morning, what is your Philistine this morning? What is my Philistine this morning that surrounds us and distracts us from victorious living. Could it be we're not making time to read the word? Could it be we're not getting in our prayer closet and seeking God's will and direction for our lives? Could it be that we worry and fret about things that we have no control over instead of giving it to God? Could it be that our lives have become so busy with everything this world has to offer that it actually becomes a burden. And I'll tell you folks, I'm speaking to myself because I had to deal with this. Yes. And in my spirit, and you see, I know for a lot of years, I wasted. I felt like I was keeping God at an arm's length, never doubting my salvation, but, but not being where God wanted me to be in my walk with him. 
And I will admit I had to repent. And over time, with God's help, in the Holy Spirit's direction, he has shown me the most important thing in my life is my relationship with him. But that is one of Satan's biggest weapons against us, distraction and discouragement. He will do everything in his power to make us think we're nothing, that he can wipe us out with one blow. He'll feed us any lie he can to affect our relationship with God. In John 10.10, 10, Jesus tells us the thief Satan comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But at the end of that verse, Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And I actually like the King James Version for this verse better. It says that you might have life and more abundantly. Now we look at the world today and we see a lot of so-called successful people who think they're living a victorious life. They seem to have it all, money, power, fame, you name it. And there's nothing wrong with those things if they're in Christ Jesus. Amen. But you see, they're not happy. Deep down within the depths of their soul, something's missing. Something just doesn't feel right. There's an emptiness that's only filled with a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you folks, I wouldn't trade what you and I have today in Christ Jesus for what they have 10 times over. Amen. But Satan will try and tell us we're missing out. He'll attack us, he'll come at us from every side. And if we're not read up and prayed up and have that close relationship with the Lord, he can keep us beat down in defeat. And I'm not saying we're not going to have our trials and tribulations. Until God extracts us from this sinful planet, we will experience in our share of troubles. But all thank God for his promises. The same promise he gave to Joshua is for you and I today. One of my favorite verses in the Bible. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thy dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Praise God. Now what that verse says to me is if we stay close to God, no matter what we face, no matter what hardships we encounter, no matter what the circumstances look like around us, no matter how many darts or arrows the Philistines and our enemy Satan throws at us, we can achieve victory by following the Almighty's command. Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thy dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee wheresoever thou goest. The kind of faith and courage Noah had to obey God and build an ark in the midst of ridicule from a godless society. The kind of faith and courage it took for Abraham to follow God's instruction on receiving the inheritance to go to a place, the Bible says, that he knew not where he was going. The kind of faith and courage it took for Daniel to say no I will only bow down to my God, Jehovah, knowing the consequences was to be thrown in the lion's den. But after walking out in the morning, he says to the king, do not fear, for the Lord whom I serve hath delivered me from the mouths of those lions. The faith and courage it took for David as a young boy that most Bible scholars believe to be around the age of 15 to go up against the giant Philistine, Goliath, nine feet, nine inches tall. How would you like to have him on your basketball team? <laughs> nine feet, nine inches tall with 125 pounds of armor on him. And David boldly says to him, this day, the Lord whom I serve will deliver me into your hands. And we could mention many more. But Adam said I had to keep this under an hour. <laughs> Sorry, Adam. <laughs> but
But all these examples, they were convinced in their faith and trust in God that God had their back. That what the enemy, as that song said that they played, what the enemy meant for evil, God turned it for good. Praise the Lord. We as believers have to be convinced in our heart and our minds that God is for us. He is for us. But the only way we can have victory in our Christian walk is by getting into his word and believing the promises he has given us. And spending time with him in prayer and seeking his direction for our lives. But no matter what age we are, young or old, we continue to grow in the Lord. He will bless us beyond measure with peace, joy, happiness, and the promise of spending eternity with him. And then the devil is going to do everything in his power, as the Bible says, to steal, kill, and destroy. And it's up to us to defend it. With as Paul says in Ephesians, using the shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Uh, I love the message in the song, and uh, my favorite song that you guys do of course, is mercy. That song, when you guys sang it over at the other church, man, it was powerful. That song ministers to me more than I think any song I've ever heard. But there's a song that Natalie Grant sings that I think is also powerful. His presence is my weapon. I mean, that's powerful. The presence of God yes. is our weapon. Amen. Our struggle, our battle is spiritual. Paul tells us in Ephesians 6, 12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil. Our battle in this Christian walk is not against Russia, or China, or North Korea, or even our political adversaries. But I do think we as Christians have a responsibility to speak out against such things as the scourge of abortion and, the, and Christians being persecuted around the world and the fight for our Judeo-Christian freedoms that God gave this country. But our battle is spiritual, and the God we serve who is on the throne will deal with those who make war and cause trouble and evil on this earth. And really, what does the word tell us to do? Pray for our enemies. Pray for those who persecute us. And other than Jesus, who was our greatest example, there's a man named Stephen in the seventh chapter of the book of Acts. And Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit, was chastising and preaching the gospel of Christ and him crucified to the Pharisees and to those gathered, and to the members of the Sanhedrin. And it says in verse 54, they became furious and gnashed their teeth at him. And on down in verse 57, they covered their ears and began yelling at the top of their voices as they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And in verse 60, it says Stephen fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Stephen's battle was not against flesh and blood. It was totally spiritual. But as we walk this road of faith, God expects us to grow in his knowledge and grace, draw closer to him. But as long as we have these earthly vessels, there will be times when doubt and unbelief can creep in. But here, as they say, the rubber meets the road. Unbelief and doubt just stays there and says, I don't know what I'm going to do. Unbelief and doubt says it's so bad. Unbelief and doubt says everybody else gets blessed, but I go to church and get nothing. Unbelief and doubt says nobody can build a church in this town. Well, this church is being built by the grace of God. But when the enemy knocks us down, in that same dirt, face right down in the middle of it, faith starts to grit its teeth and starts to push and says, devil, I may be down, but by the help 
and grace of Almighty God, I'm going to get up and I'm going to believe him and trust in him to see me through. You see, once Jesus came to this earth to fulfill God's plan at Calvary with his death, burial, and resurrection, our battle became a spiritual one. But in the Old Testament, God made promises and a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And one of those promises was the promised land. And he told them to defend it, and he would give them victory over their enemies. But here we find the Israelites gathered on a piece of ground full of lentils or bean plants, ready to be harvested. And after working the ground and laboring and for months, they, they're about ready to enjoy the fruits of their labor. And then they look up and they see this troop of Philistines coming over the hill. And they ran scared for their lives. But there was one man, Shammah. Glory to God, Shammah. He's right there in the middle of that bean patch. And he sees them coming. And in his heart, he says, I'm tired of running. I'm sick of those Philistines kicking us around and taking what God has given us. I'm an Israelite. I'm one of God's chosen. Jehovah God is on my side, and I've run for the last time. I'm staying right here in the middle of this bean patch. And the devil says, I'll kill you. You might do it, devil, but I'll die with bean plants hanging all over me because I've run for the last time. Are we listening? We, we've got to serve notice on the devil. The promises in this book are ours. And in verse 12, it says, Shammah took his stand in the middle of the field. He defended it and struck the Philistines down, and the Lord wrought a great victory. And I can picture this scene as plain as day when I was preparing this message. And Shammah stands in the middle of this field after striking every Philistine down. It just says a troop. It didn't really say the number, but, you know, it could be 20, 30, 40, 50. Who knows? But he stands in the middle of that bean patch defending it with God. God's the one who gave him the power to do it with his sword. He struck every one of them down in the middle of that bean patch. And I can see him when the dust and smoke cleared, waving his sword of victory, giving glory to God. And there's one more song I like that uh, music really ministers to me, the words. I mean, you guys, maybe you know it. And perhaps you've even sung it. And I'll end with this. The cross is spoken, I am forgiven. The King of Kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Let's pray.